Welcome to the first video of the semester. I hope you got a chance to look at that introductory video. If not, go ahead and pause this for a second. Go watch the introduction so you have an idea of what you need to do for this class. But for those of you who have already seen the introduction video, uh, this is the first lecture video here. And we're going to talk about the Gilded Age, which is the time period from about 1877 to 1900. It's after the Civil War has happened. It's after Reconstruction has happened. And it's a time of change in America. First of all, let's look at presidential politics. I know there's a lot of politics in the news right now, uh, both presidential and congressional politics, but it wasn't always as in your face as it is today. Uh, from 1877 to 1896, most people can't name those presidents. There's Rutherford B. Hayes who ends construction. Uh, Grover Cleveland becomes president twice in there. Uh, James Garfield is assassinated. He's replaced by Chester Arthur who does civil service reform because of the assassination of James Garfield. Most of these presidents are just content holding office. They're very pro-business. They don't stand out really they don't do anything extra uh, congress is very much the same congress is very pro-business but congress was very strong um, even though all three of the branches of government are supposed to be equal sometimes some are more equal than others and this was the time period where con congress was in charge america is changing after the civil war Prior to the Civil War, there were what I like to call island communities. Um, your town was pretty much self-sufficient. There wasn't a lot of large-scale travel. But when we get into the 1870s, that's starting to change because of the railroad and because of the telegraph. The railroad is connecting cities all over the country. And wherever the railroad lines go, the telegraph lines go as well. And the telegraph was the internet of the day. Uh, you could get news cross country in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of days like it used to be. Education becomes formalized. Everybody is supposed to have a rudimentary education by the time we get to the end of the 1800s. And this idea of American education is kind of going to formulate a unique American ideal and a unique American thought, if you will. Democracy is going to go nationwide. Uh, while every place in America obviously had democracy, depending where you were, democracy meant something different. Uh, Wyoming allowed women to vote, where you couldn't really find that on the East Coast. Uh, so with the spreading of America, the spreading of railroads, the spreading of t the telegraph and news and information, politics really go national. We also shift from being agrarian to urban, meaning more and more people are starting to move into the cities. Corporations develop, businesses become bigger, and the rural farmer, the countryside farmer you would find from the Civil War and before, starts to die out just a little bit. Now, railroads are important, obviously, because it's travel, it's transportation. But more than that, railroads were the first large-scale industry. You start to really see railroads in the 1840s after coal is discovered in Pennsylvania. And by the late 1860s, you've got the first transcontinental railroad. Uh, it's completed in May of 1869. And these railroads are going to lead to new types of organizations and new types of skill sets. Uh, you have to schedule cross country for these railroads. You have to be able to manage and keep up with all of these employees moving across the country. You have to keep up with this, these massive amounts of dollars. So bookkeeping and accounting become really important. You also start to get these administrative hierarchies because the railroads have to hire people who work all across the country. And then the corporate system has to keep track of all these people. 
It means you have to get executives to monitor and keep up with everything. And then you have salaried workers who are doing the day-to-day -day work to keep the railroads going. And as I said, wherever the railroads go, the telegraphs go as well. So news and information moves along with these railroads. Now, what are these railroads going to be used for? One of the big things is distribution. Uh, between the railroads and the telegraphs, you can order items for sale that aren't in your city. People in the middle of the country can order stuff from Chicago and New York for the first time. And this allows for these buyers to purchase items from these large suppliers. And the railroads will move all of these goods from the supplier warehouses to you. There are some very big distributors at the time who went on to become some of the largest department stores in our country. Marshall Fields, A.T. Stewart, Wanamakers, and Macy's. Uh, while they don't really exist very much anymore today, uh, they started as railroad distribution companies and then they became brick and mortar department stores and now they either don't exist or they're kind of going out of business. Uh, Montgomery Wards went on to become a mail order company. Sears and Roebuck started as a mail order company and um, they both technically do exist still today. But all these companies, they would order homes, they would order clothes, they would order goods and services and then ship them across the country using the railroads. And yes, the picture in the corner there is a home kit. Sears used to sell homes and the materials would arrive on a train, be sent to the job site, and then the homeowner would build their own home. We also have to look at manufacturing because manufacturing firms become really big after the Civil War. These or organizational skills and these distribution networks and the railroad being able to transport goods all times of the day and all weathers really kickstarts manufacturing. Factories are going to develop that work constantly day in and day out. And there are these continuous process machines where raw materials come in one end of the building and finished products come out the end and there's no stop. Uh, one modern day example of this continuous process machinery is car manufacturing. If you know anybody who works in car manufacturing, raw materials come in one end, finished cars come out the next. Businesses become larger and larger between the end of the Civil War and 1900. And there are two different ways that these corporations are born and developed. The first one you have is vertical integration. Um, you have manufacturers who they combine all different parts of the process in one. So you got supply, production, distribution all together. But then you have horizontal integration where companies merge together to reduce competition. So vertical integration, the business controls everything from top to bottom. Horizontal integration, you buy your competition to reduce the number of competitors. And with the development of these corporations and with these companies getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the United States starts to develop a permanent class of workers. Uh, we got the robber barons, and everybody likes learning about these. Uh, what's a robber baron? They were the large, famous, wealthy from the Gilded Age. Now, I just have a couple of them mentioned here, but there were many, many more than this. Andrew Carnegie, who is at the bottom left, is probably the most famous. Uh, he was in the steel industry, and he was the wealthiest man in the world at his time. Uh, J.P. Morgan, who is the bottom right, if you see the mouse going around in a circle here, that is James Pierpont Morgan. He's the one who created General, Election, General Electric, I'm sorry, and he became so rich that he actually bought the Carnegie Steel Company from Andrew Carnegie. And then John D. Rockefeller, who is the bottom 
right? He created Standard Oil, which does still exist today in one form or another. If you've ever gotten gas at BP or Amico or Chevron or even Marathon, all of those different fuel companies used to be part of Standard Oil. Now, not to leave him out, right here, this gentleman is Andrew Mellon, and he developed a new way to make uh, aluminum and became rich off of the aluminum trade. The Gilded Age saw an interesting philosophy called social Darwinism. There are two people who developed this, Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner. And you can read what it says there, the easiest way to understand it. Uh, the poor were poor for a reason. And it's like survival of the fittest. The poor should be eliminated by nature because they're weak and the government should not help the poor. This idea of social Darwinism is going to be actually a tool to promote racism. Um, there's a gentleman from the time period named Reverend Josiah Strong. In 1885, he wrote a book called Our Country, where he says, universal progress, the idea of moving forward and improving yourself is okay as long as white Anglo-Saxons remain at the top of society. Many times social Darwinists felt threatened by immigration, Catholics, Mormons, drinking, socialists, pretty much anything that could upend society and change society. Now, there were many arguments against social Darwinism. Mostly, they centered around the idea that education is the great equalizer. And if everybody is educated, then everybody has a chance at society. And other people said there's a difference between the survival of the fittest in the animal kingdom versus the survival of the fittest in civilization. And in a civilized people, survival of the fittest should not exist. And Lester Ward and Washington Gladden were two of the big anti-social Darwinist speakers out there. Now, what were labor conditions like at this time? Well, there was different than today. Um, working conditions, you usually work 10 to 12 hours a day and you worked six days a week. You got Sundays off for church. Uh, on top of that, though, you usually only worked about nine months of the year, meaning that all the money you made during those nine months, you actually had to budget for 12. Pay rates varied depending on if you were in the North or the South. Pay rates also varied depending on if you were men or women. Men in the North would make about $3 a day. If they were skilled workers, if they're unskilled workers, they make about $1.25. In the South, skilled workers, of which there were very, very few, made about $1.50 a day, and unskilled workers, half of that at 75 cents a day. Women never considered skilled, even if they were, and they were always at the bottom half of the pay bracket. There's also very little concern for safety. Today, if you work in a manufacturing center, or even if you work at Publix, there are safety regulations in place that you must follow. None of that existed in the late 1800s. You had things like black lung, which was from breathing in coal, brown lung, which was breathing in textiles and fabric dust, and white lung even, which was from breathing in baking materials. It was very often for fatalities to happen. It was very often for injuries to happen that required you to miss more than a month of work. So your labor was not protected. It was not safe. It was not guaranteed. If you are hurt on the job, there's no compensation. There's no insurance. It was deemed that hazards were the risk of the employee. Women workers were relegated to teaching, nursing, domestic work, no manufacturing, no jobs in 
factories, nothing like that. And you even have children as young as five working. Uh, Five-year-old children would be forced to work in factories. And they would be subject to the injuries and all. Now, there are three Supreme Court cases that you should know for this lecture. In 1898, there's a lecture called Holden versus Hardy. And miners are limited to an eight-hour workday because mining is considered a dangerous occupation. In 1905, there's a Supreme Court case called Lochner versus New York that gets rid of a limit on how many hours bakers can work because baking is not seen as a hazardous profession. Then in 1908, there's Mueller versus Oregon. And in Mueller versus Oregon, women do get limited on how many hours they can work because it's deemed the cleaning fumes are toxic. So mining is dangerous. Linens and laundry is dangerous. Baking is not, according to the Supreme Court cases at this time. This is also a time period of strikes, and the biggest strike of the time was the strike of 1877. And for this week, you actually have to read a couple of newspaper clippings from this time period. Now, where does the strike of 1877 come from? Well, it comes out of the end of the Civil War, and it comes out of the failure of Reconstruction. There's a depression in the 1870s, which means people can't afford to buy things. When people can't afford to buy things, then not as much stuff is distributed on the railroads. When the rail traffic falls, the owners of the railroad companies quit paying their workers or pay them less. Before you know it, workers on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad go on strike and they stop the trains from moving. Eventually, the strike is going to spread all the way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when workers on the Pennsylvania Railroad join the strike. And this is going to be significant because the Pennsylvania Railroad is going to bring in private security guards known as the Pinkertons. And these Pinkertons are going to be ordered to protect company property, and they're also going to be ordered to break the strike and force these workers to go back to work. Well, before you know it, there's actually a gunfight that breaks out between the strikers and the Pinkertons. And the Pinkertons are run off of company property. At the end, state militias are called out to try to keep order. And then it gets so bad that President Rutherford B. Hayes calls in the U.S. mail, or calls in the U.S. Army, not to help the workers, but to ensure that the U.S. mail continues to be delivered. As a result of these strikes, unionization numbers really start to rise. And there are two early labor unions that you should know. There's the Knights of Labor. They're formed in 1877 by a, an Irishman named Terence Powderly. Terence Powderly, he opened up membership to his union to all wage owners, or not wage owners, but it should say wage workers. Obviously that's wrong. And people who earned money through less than honest means were excluded. You had to be somebody who worked for a living. Now, what did the Knights of Labor believe? Number one, you deserve to enjoy the product of your hard work. <clears throat> Number two, you should be able to have dollar bills instead of coin currency. There should be government regulation of the businesses, <clears throat> and women should have equal pay. The American Federation of Labor is founded in 1886 by a cigar maker named Samuel Gompers. And the American Federation of Labor was only for skilled workers. If you were an unskilled worker, if you were an African American, if you were a woman, you were not allowed into the AFL. Now, the AFL, they worked through the idea of collective bargaining, meaning that all the workers would elect representatives, and those representatives of the workers would negotiate with management and ownership. 
Now we have another very important strike. It happens in 1886 in Chicago, and it's known as the Hay Market Riot. This happens on the southwest side of Chicago in a place called uh, Pullmanville. In 1886, the Pullman Car Company, uh, they reduced the amount of hours and they reduced the amount of pay for the workers. Workers protest. And on May 4th of 1886, there are four workers killed at a McCormick harvester plant because employees there are striking for an eight hour workday. They haven't joined with other strikers in Chicago. Well, at this meeting where all these workers are protesting, a bomb is thrown into the crowd. Seven policemen are killed. Four protesters are killed. Eight people are arrested. But it turns out there's no evidence for these eight people. They are arrested and convicted without any proof. Four of the eight are executed, three of them commit suicide, and then the remaining three are, are pardoned by the governor of Illinois because there's no proof that any of this happened, that the labor activists were involved. So the Pullman strike is going to begin on May 11th of 1894, and that's where the Pullman Palace car cuts the worker pay by 25%, still in Chicago, um, and when the workers demand to meet with the owner of the company and when the workers demand to understand why their, their pay had been cut, the owner, George Pullman, refuses to meet with the workers. Workers go on strike. The factory is locked behind the workers. And when news of this gets out, railroad employees across the country refuse to hook up Pullman brand cars to their trains and trains stop around the country. Before you know it, violence breaks out, federal troops are called in to stop the strike, and eventually the strike ends, but the workers don't get their money back. Now you may ask about farmers. Um, farmers are affected by this distribution and the growth of railroads and everything else just as much as, as factory workers are. Everywhere the towns go, or everywhere the railroads go, towns are set up. But before you know it, there are towns across the country, wherever the railroads are, and these towns provide farmers with direct access to larger markets. So farmers grow their, their crops, they take it to town, they load it on the trains, and the trains go back to the big cities. Not only that, but for the first time, you start to have mechanized farming, tractors, and plows, chemical fertilizers are all available for farmers to use. And it's all expensive and it puts a big burden on farmers. And farmers, they know that, that money and railroads are important and required for this new form of farming, but they don't trust them. They feel like banks and railroads are using them and taking too much money from them. And it's not really working out so well. The farmers are going to create their own sort of unions, if you will, but they're called farmers alliances. And this is primarily because the farmers didn't think that the, that the government was really helping them. So you end up with the farmers banding together to try and negotiate farm prices, try to negotiate interest rates, all of these things are affecting farmers. They're, the prices are going down. There's not much money. It's hard to get loans. You're being overcharged. Well, these farm unions become known as the Grange or Farmers Alliances. And you end up with the Southern Grange, the National Colored Farmers Alliance, the Northwestern Farmers Alliance, the National Farmers Alliance, and eventually these farming alliances or these granges are going to turn into a political movement. And by the time we get to 1890, the farmers alliances have elected multiple people into positions of government. Over time, these farmers alliances are going to create a political party known as the People's Party. The People's Party, better known as the Populists, uh, they believed in reducing tariffs, meaning it would be less expensive to buy equipment from overseas. 
a graduated income tax, meaning that those who make less money pay fewer taxes. Public ownership of railroads, they thought this would control and lower the price of shipping goods. Free silver. Now, free silver meant using silver as the basis of the American dollar instead of gold. What that was supposed to do was allow more money to be printed and reduce inflation. Now, the populace also didn't want land ownership by aliens. And what that means is they didn't want immigrants to be able to own land. Now, in the 1892 presidential election, populists get over 1 million votes. That was almost 10% of all votes at the time. Multiple people get elected into government from the populist party. The problem with the populist party, though, is there's no support in New England because it's so urban and there's no support in many of the Midwest cities because that's where manufacturing is done. The People's Party is almost exclusively a Southern thing and a Western thing. Now, in 1896, populists try again, uh, but the ideas that the populist party stood for are actually stolen by the Democratic Party. So in 1892, the Populist Party wanted reduced tariffs. They wanted a graduate income tax. They wanted this idea of free silver. Well, in 1896, that's what the Democratic Party said they want. In 1896, both the Populists and the Democratic Party nominate William Jennings Bryan to be the presidential candidate. And William Jennings Bryan is going to be against this Ohio Republican named William McKinley. It's a very expensive election, the most expensive up to its time. And when the election is over, William McKinley is going to win by over 600,000 votes, which at the time was fairly significant. And just like the populace of 1892 did not have support in New England, did not have support in the urban areas. The Democrats had that same issue. William McKinley wins the cities, he wins industry, he wins New England, and he wins big. All right, that is it for your first lecture. Uh, I hope it's enjoyable. If there's anything else you would like to see from these lectures, just email me and let me know and I'll see if I can incorporate them. Um, it's three o'clock on the 12th of July right, or January right now. If you send me an email saying that you watched this all the way to the end by the 14th at 3 p.m., I'll give you an extra 10 points on your, we'll put it on your quiz for this week. I just want to know that you are watching these and that you are going to watch them all. So once again, it's three o'clock on Tuesday, the 12th. If you send me an email in Blackboard by three o'clock on Thursday, the 14th saying, hey, I watched your video, I'll add 10 points to your first quiz. Until next time, we'll see you later. Have a great week. Bye-bye.